programs broadcast. This is really a blast from the past. This is a webinar that I did about seven years ago. And I, I thought about it, we're going through some of the old webinars and, and redoing them. And some of them we're not, we're not really redoing because they, they've taken on, or our work, my work has taken on an evolution of sorts. And so some of them become irrelevant. And I thought about this one and paused for a moment. I thought so much of what I talk about is the relationship-based therapy uh, versus the behavioral therapy. And so maybe it's covered currently, but as I read through the old slides and I, as I read through the old content and the description, I thought to myself, I, I think it really can be relevant for what we're doing. And I, I want to give you a glimpse into the evolution in, in the field of wilderness therapy and treatment for adolescents and young adults and the work, that, how it's evolved with our work with parents. So, and I think, as always, it has some applica application to the work that parents are, are doing in our program. So let's first talk about behavioral theory, behavioral therapy, what, what its goals are, how, how it thinks about things, and how it approaches things. Um, I'll talk very simply about a, a few different ways that we reinforce behavior, the ways that we extinguish behavior. And, and I think there's a key piece in here that, that helps you understand what and, and why certain aspects of a behavioral reinforcement schedule are, are more helpful than others. Of course, rewarding is reinforcing a behavior that you want to see increase. Punishment, and I think that's a huge button for a lot of people. In fact, I've heard clients, students over the years use the word punishment as kind of a, an emotional blackmail for their parents. Like, this program is just a punishment or you're just punishing me. And I think we as parents are so aversive to the idea of punishment because it comes with so many negative connotations that we shy away from that and can be held hostage by it. But simply, technically put, punishment is an aversive consequence, an aversive response to behavior that we want to see decrease. So while the thrust of evoke therapy programs, the thrust of a treatment facility, the, the, the thrust of an intervention may not be a punishment, it's okay to acknowledge that there are some things that are unpleasant about this, right? That there's some things aversive to this. I'll talk a little bit later about the weakness of punishment and why, compared to some of the other things, it doesn't stand up to the research in terms of how it generalizes and then how it maintains its, its positive effects on individuals. Extinction is removing a reward for behavior that you want to see decrease. It's, think of a child throwing a tantrum and taking away the reward. One of the things to, to note about extinction, and I talk about this in the, the, the broadcast that talks more, more in depth about behavioral theory, is that you're going to see an extinction burst, right? An increase in behavior after you remove the reward. And so I think that prepares us as parents, as therapists, to say this doesn't automatically work. And this is something very important. The more inconsistent or variable the reward has been in the past, the more that you're going to see that extinction burst last. Think of a slot machine, right? Randomly reinforcing somebody pulling its lever. That's what makes it so addictive is the mind says just one more try, just one more try, five more tries because they get randomly reinforced. And so when we as parents, and I think every human is guilty of randomly reinforcing our children's negative behavior at times because it's exhausting, right? Because we get worn down, because we don't have a lot of energy, because sometimes it's easier to hand them that piece of candy at the checkout line at the grocery store than it is to withstand the nagging or, or the potential tantrum that they might throw. So that's a compassionate perspective about it, but it also helps us understand why the behavior will continue. And in our program, or in any intervention for that matter, you, when, you're, when you're trying to intervene with your child and you see them not responding to the intervention, part of it can be in this principle, right? That at times their manipulation, their threats, their defeatist kind of language, I give up, I'm not going to do this, I can't has been reinforced because we eventually have been triggered. We have been eventually have come to the end of our ropes and we've reinforced it. 
Negative reinforcement is removing a negative punishment in order to see behavior that you want to increase. It's not a very easy one to conceptualize, but thinking, think about uh, the speed limit and a speeding ticket, right? You're removing the ticket, if you will. You're saying to people, if you go over 65 miles an hour, you're going to get a ticket. And so you're increasing the behavior uh, of traveling under 65. So that's a very practical ex explanation or example. Um, for behavioral theorists, theorists, they're interested in behavioral change not at what happens inside the black box or between the ears, right? They don't pay a lot of attention to that. It's not important to them. Um, it's externally motivated, right? It, it relies upon external reinforces, external punishment. There's a pro and con to this because developmentally, small children respond better to simple behavior re reinforcements. And if given too much or too often, if not adjusted for as the child grows into pre-adolescence and adolescence, then the child can become dependent upon that, right? It's like a drug. They, they stop producing, if you will, the internal motivation. And behavioral ther theorists encourage us to randomly reinforce positive behaviors, right? Don't give them a reward for every A, for every home run, virtually or, or literally, but rather give them rewards occasionally for positive behaviors that you want to see continue. You know, so it's important to look at it developmentally. I think one of the most common mistakes that I talk about is that parents think that children are like little adults. And we imagine, because we see them like little adults, that we can reason them into change, right? That we can lecture them into change, teach them into change, explain it into change. And oftentimes it's really effective to have simple, not punitive, but simple, straightforward, logical, and natural consequences to reinforce or shape behavior. That can be an okay part of the process, even if we get to what I'm going to talk about a little bit later, more relational aspects of, of therapy and of the theory. Sometimes it removes the power struggle. And this might seem ironic to people. So much of the power struggle is really in the emotional engagement, right? The emotional coercion, the emotional push and pull. There, there's this idea of doing it for me, doing it to make me happy. Whereas behavioral theory removes the emotional element. It just pays attention to simple behavioral change and simple reinforcement. The pros, people will argue that it's a lot like real life, that Real life and a lot of context don't reward you for your process. They reward you for your outcome, right? The police officer that pulls you over may not be sympathetic to the stress that you're experiencing in your life. Your boss at work, your teacher, your professor may not be sympathetic to some of the things that you're struggling with or, or, or what you've learned. They might just pay attention to the outcome. So it has application to, to real life. It takes the emotion out of it, right? It invites a, a more rational response from us as parents. Because so much of the, the abuse that we might inflict upon our children is through the guilting and the shaming and the coercion. So this removes that out of the equation. It helps remove power struggle, excuse me, it helps remove power struggle out of the, the equation, like I said. Right? You're not doing it. To, to impress your parents. You're not doing it to make them proud. You're not doing it to make them happy. You're doing it because there's a simple reward. Sometimes the, the, the skill development and the, the coping development is fostered by this, right? Because it's so outcome oriented that it requires people to problem solve, to accomplish something. Um, and this idea that I talk about in my book and talk about often, that we, we don't give enough credence that sometimes insight comes out of behavior change. In the 12-step recovery world, they have a phrase that says, fake it till you make it. And there are motivational books that talk about this idea that when you change a habit over time, you start to feel and think differently. I think a lot of us can relate to that in our lives with New Year's resolutions and goals that we have. 
that sometimes the feeling, the insight, the reward comes after we've changed the behavior and changed it for some time. The cons, of course, the argument would be that it's, that it's superficial. That when you're paying attention to behaviors, it's akin to mowing over weeds. You're removing visually the weed itself, but the roots are still there. And they're going to crop up somewhere else in the garden if we don't pull them out at the root, address them at the root. One of the difficulties, especially with punishment, is avoidance learning. Right? Think, about, think about the speed limit, for example. For many of us, we still speed a few miles over, a handful of miles over the speed limit, but we look for police officers. Right? We're checking our rearview mirror, and we slow down when we see a police officer you know, several lengths ahead of us. So what we're learning to do is avoid the consequence, not necessarily avoiding the behavior. The question is, is it internalized? Does it become dependent upon external structure? And that's why that randomly reinforcement schedule can be effective. Um, it, it's not the original context of the problem, right? It's not what's going on. The basic idea that, that I have, that we see, is the behaviors are evidence of, of wounds or, or, or healing or health. And that when they become symptoms, that they're just the voice of a wound, of, of a pain. And when they become healthy skills, they're a voice of, they're the voice of healing, of maturity, of spiritual, emotional, intellectual uh, evolution. So it's not really the original problem. Um, and, and then there's a low relational focus, right? Um, it does help, does help get out of, of the power struggle, but there's a loss there about what we're going to talk about and how it develops the self a little bit later. Let's talk about a relationally based approach to therapy in contrast. A relationally based piece of work is the relationship between the therapist and client become a part of the work, right? Talking to the therapist about how you feel about them, about your reaction to them, and vice versa. The therapist transparently sharing his or her reaction to the client. I'm feeling anxious right now, for example, or I'm feeling pressured, I'm feeling afraid. You know, talking to a parent, so many of our therapists over, over years and decades have said that one of the most effective things that they've done in their work with families is to share with a parent what it sounds like, what it feels like, excuse me, to be on the other end of the phone call. And I wonder if your child feels this way. You know, share with a parent after reading a letter, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm experiencing. I wonder if your child's experiencing that. So the transparent disclosure of transference and countertransference is the technical term. Talking about that can be an effective way to not get caught up in it, to not get lost in it. And I've always thought, and, and I've, I've had this from my, my two mentors in the therapeutic field, that some of the most courageous difficult and important work is the work that a client does when they share their feelings towards the therapist. You know, when I go to my therapist and say, I didn't feel heard, or I felt frustrated, or I felt ashamed last week, or I felt angry last week, not about my wife or my children or my friends, but about you and what you were saying to me. And if you have an adequate therapist, they're going to tune into that, right? They're going to see you, hear you, and hold that with, with respect and with honor. It minimizes the importance of behavior. However, behavior transforms over time. It's not getting up on it. It's going deeper and deeper to the root of it. And so it requires more patience. It's Socratic more than didactic. It's, it's, it's asking questions. You know, the, the name of evoke, in part, is born out of this idea that we evoke, that we pull out of the client, of the family, the truth that is hidden inside of them, the truth that is, is somewhere inside of them that they've lost. And that discovering that, that authentic, raw self is the process of therapy. 
And that's the Socratic method, asking questions. Instead of imposing one's truth on somebody. Storytelling is a part of it. Right? Giving examples through stories. Stories have the, the benefit of, of seeding the unconscious. And, and stories allow like parables. Right? They allow for the individual to meet the therapist where the client is at. So if I share with you a fable or a story or a parable or an allegory, you can hear it at, at whatever level you're at. And the deeper levels are still present in that story. It's flexible, right? It, it doesn't see every client as one size fits all. The therapist is, is mobile, moves around, meets the client where they're at. The relationship with the, the group, with the therapist, becomes a microcosm. It's viewed less as right and wrong, good and bad. Views, viewed less in terms of what should be happening. And it looks at what is happening and what does that mean. And can we follow that, that trail of crumbs back to the origin of the issue? That could be in the family of origin. That could be in a learning difficulty. That could be in a divorce. Right? That could be in being bullied. That could be in messages from the culture, on and on and on. Making sure that it's a good clinical fit. Making sure, you know, most therapists have um, predispositions, propensities towards certain approaches and perspective. But most effective therapists are also eclectic, will borrow from various approaches. We'll use a cognitive behavioral example when it applies. We'll use a 12-step model when it seems to fit. We'll use a psychodynamic, family, family systems approach when that seems most relevant. There, there's an empathic connection that happens, and it's reparative, right? Finding the client, relating to the client, being honest and authentic with the client promotes connection. And connection is the most healing thing in the universe. It's the thing that builds resiliency and esteem. Is my ability, my ability as a therapist to resonate with you, the client. And to be on the receiving end of that resonance heals, heals trauma, binds wounds, really helps foster and develop a self. Because when a self is seen, a self flourishes. When a self isn't seen and is compromised in the, the, in the wake of an agenda, then it shrivels and it struggles. Right? And talking about projections and countertransference and transference, talking about the way we talking about the way we are with somebody. Modeling authenticity, vulnerability, letting down one's walls as a parent. I talk about this all the time. I talked about this with the parent this week. Instead of giving your child a lecture about peer pressure and about the source of self-esteem coming from some invisible place within inside yourself, share with them your own, your own struggle with esteem, your own struggle with fitting in. That will be as healing as anything. Um, the pros of a relational model, of course, it are that it's, uh, it promotes con a buy-in, right? Because it doesn't force itself. It makes an invitation. And so the acceptance of that invitation, we'd be assumed to be more meaningful. Accessing the client, it accesses the client's own resources, right? It draws upon their strengths and, and inner wisdom. Instead of, I know the truth, I'm the guru, I'm the expert, I'm going to give that to you. So it helps them develop something. Um, it, it appeals to people's sense of democracy. right? People that value a kind of non-hierarchical approach in life 
are drawn toward this. And then most importantly, it focuses on the development of self. In this way of thinking, therapy is not problem solving. Therapy is not even problem focused necessarily. Therapy is about developing the self. The cons, of course, is that young children may not have the capacity to participate in therapy in this way. That's why with younger people, we use things like play therapy more, right? That's why experiential therapy at Evoke Therapy programs is so valuable because it's not necessarily talk therapy. It's not accessing the trauma, the pain, and the healing through kind of the verbal parts of the brain, but through the experiential, the, the, all of the senses. Um, the, the biggest downside of relational-based therapy is that it's labor and time intensive. Right? It takes a long time. I was talking with, with a client that I've had for, for many years recently, and he was talking about how when he talks to his friends, it's hard to explain how therapy works because it takes so long. I did an interview this week with an online resource for parenting. And they were asking some very basic questions about behavioral contracts and charts. And, and I paused at the beginning and said, it's hard to answer this question because it doesn't do the work. It's not that simple. There still is something in the work between a parent and child that tra transcends and goes beyond contracts and charts. And it's about this, this self-work, the self of the parent. It's what I talked about last week with the awakened parent. Right? It's what the journey of the heroic parent talks about. It requires a, a long journey. Now, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be too negative about that because it can start. Right? I, I carry around still to this day pieces of my sixth grade teacher. We still keep in contact. Still love him. He still talks about me as one of his favorite parts of teaching when he was a little kid, when it was his, excuse me, when I was a little kid, and it, it was his first year being a full-time teacher. He only taught for a few years and went on to become an entrepreneur. But there was a bond there. There was a closeness there. He saw me. He saw me struggling, and he put a great deal of energy into me, and it made a difference for the rest of my life. So it can have, it, it can be the start. I think about that with the clients that I've worked with over the years. Even if I could just have some moments of seeing them, they can carry around some piece of me, some internal copy of me that can sustain them. Client-centered therapies. In behavioral, in, in reaction to behavioral therapy, there came along what is called this third wave, a humanistic approach. It was a reaction against deterministic philosophies of psychodynamic and behavioral therapies, right? It was this idea that there was something beyond this idea of cause and effect. And so they talked about the, the client-centered approach. Carl Rogers uh, was one of the pioneers of the client-centered approach, where virtually in his model, all he did was reflect. Now, the examples of Rogers seems so elementary and seems so annoying at times. But, but the, the core pieces of Rogerian therapy are present today in the kind of work that we do, hearing and seeing and understanding and reflecting. We use a more uh, sophisticated palette than Rogers does in, in our examples, but that's a part of it. This idea that when a client experiences unconditional positive regard, that it heals them. Again, not behaviorally immediately, but over time. It repairs attachment fractures in the child's psyche and in the child's brain. Um, elect, like I said, eclecticism, drawing upon several models can be appropriate, and, and most experienced therapists do that. At Evoke, we do that. You know, the, the core of our program is experiential. Much of our approach is client-centered, relational, and we have, as kind of the, 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 the side salad, if you will, behavioral components of the program that can be valuable also, especially with high-risk, dangerous behaviors. Sometimes what fits the therapist 
is most effective. And some studies it shows it's not what approach works the most or the best, but it's the approach that the therapist is most invested in. In other words, when they assign in, in research design, when they assign therapists other approaches, other paradigms, other theories, the therapy is less effective. When they assign therapists their own approach, their own perspective to, to a problem, to a client, they find it to be more effective. Um, why is it okay to consider all of these? Because we're, we're trying to find a way to meet the child, the client where they're at, the family where they're at for that matter. And it, it's, it's, it, it, I think a lot of times early in theory, some of the, the, the therapeutic scholars will talk about that early in, in the development and the proposal of a theory, that people become really dogmatic, you know, the adamant subscribers to the theory. And that's necessary for the, the generation of a new theory to, to get exposure. But part of what we try to do is draw upon the wisdom of all of it. And I think most important that I would, that I would take away from the, looking at the various theories is to help parents, like I say, to learn how to think, to learn how to reason their way through a problem, to develop a way of thinking, critical thinking, that helps you to come to your own solution. So often the clients I've worked with over the years Say, in fact, somebody who said it at a parent meeting last month. They say, I try to imagine what you might say in this situation. And what they're saying is, I can imagine your way of thinking. I've heard you respond. I've heard you talk. I've heard you teach. And I'm trying to think about how, how you might respond to it. And then I test that against what you might say to a given question or example or anecdote. I want to talk about, like I said, a little bit about the, the therapeutic evolution that I've seen over the last 22 years in this field. The early models of wilderness therapy and residential program. Early on, they were punitive. It was this idea that you could break them down. I never liked that theory. In fact, some of the things on, on the left side of this page, when I came on the scene in 1996, my response was, I don't like a lot of this. And, and sometimes I was told to just shut up and listen and do what, what worked. But that's why we started our program in 1998, is because we wanted to, to propel into a much more sophisticated, therapeutically grounded approach. Those early programs were intuitively created, right, by non-therapists in many cases. By people that said, well, this worked for me, the outdoors worked for me, or you know, tough love worked for me, or well, I woke up when I got my butt kicked, when I hit my bottom, so I'm going to create a, a program that kicks somebody's butt, that does something hard, that, that breaks them down, that, that really creates kind of this, this bottom so that they'll be open to change. Now, we know, and I, I said this today at a dinner talking to an alumni from 13 years ago. I said this today, that we don't need to do that punitive stuff. We don't need to march people around in circle to see what's going on. We just have to develop better vision. It can be a kind and compassionate approach, but early on it was punitive, like I said. It was much more behavioral. Um, it was created from an intuitive sense, like I said. It was provocative. I think wilderness is provocative enough. When we started ours in 98, we said, you know what? We can give them a real backpack on their first day, which didn't happen at virtually any wilderness therapy program when we started. They had, these, they had to make their own backpacks out of a tarp and seatbelt webbing. And they were difficult. And it was, a, it was an interesting metaphor. But we thought being outside 24-7 was provocative enough. Um, early on, again, was this idea that the therapist is the expert or the guru. Right? I'm going to, I know what's right and wrong, and I'm going to teach that to you. I'm going to impose that upon you. There was a, again, it wasn't, we didn't, it wasn't taught like it was overt, but there absolutely was um, the, a fear and intimidation, a shame and a guilt set of themes that, that operated in these programs. Some of the, many of them have closed down over the years that I've been doing. And I remember when I heard about some of them in the beginning, I thought to myself, 
it's unbelievable the stories I'm hearing from the clients that these things are open. Sometimes the reason these worked and sold themselves so well is that they align themselves with parental goals, right? I think a parent thinks I, I want my child to be behaving appropriately and respectfully. And these programs get it done as quickly as anything. And, and the, the, the ends justified the means. But these programs didn't challenge the family paradigm. Didn't challenge the parent's own childhood. And so what we wanted to do, what we try to do, is take you in, take what strengths you have, but then offer you something new, some perspective, some skill, some tool, some new way of thinking and being with your child. And of course, there was no family work. Just didn't do it. We were told when I started in 1996 not to do it. It was a waste of time. And then things evolved. And the first thing that we did was introduce a family focus, have families out to the program in the middle, get them on phone calls, give them a robust, a robust set of assignments to help and support them. The idea was, even though we saw Wilderness as provocatively, dynamically, impressively making changes, that to support those, those gains, because the child would eventually be in the context of his or her family, no matter what age they were, no matter how many months they're away from home, that we get the family on a different tra trajectory. Of course, shame and guilt. There, there's still a lot of programs out there who don't make this distinction, right? A lot of programs still. But at Evolve, we realized that shame and guilt are the problem, not the solution. That guilt, guilt, and sometimes many people see it as a conscience. It's not. It's just a more subtle, diluted form of shame. And that love and authenticity, curiosity, courage, right? All of those things are more important, more valuable than guilt and more consistent and more reliable. We see the behavior as a signal, but not as the goal, right? It's just evidence of the unconscious, evidence of the process. A, a kind of a lightning rod, a flag marking where we're going to pay some attention to something. Get curious about sophisticated approach to treatment, right? Multidisciplinary, psychiatrist involvement, 12-step involvement, right? All the things that we do to, to create a much more clinical model than those early intuitive models. And then compassionate approach. You know, a lot of these are our core evoke goals that you see some other places. But, but not in a lot of other places, not completely. Research-based and theoretically driven, right? That's the contrast to the intuitive model. We're going to always be doing long-term outcome research, always. And we're going to do it because we believe that things that are observed improve. We're going to do it because we're going to ask ourselves difficult questions. Um, and that is theoretically driven. I, I think that for parents, bringing this back home to parents, just because your gut tells you it doesn't mean that, that we ought not to question it, right? It's okay to say, I wonder why. What's my intention? Right? That, that's, a, that's a mantra that I repeat over and over again to parents. It's a way of thinking, asking yourself your intention. Just because it feels good, just because it's comfortable, just because your gut tells it doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve attention and questioning and evaluation. Whole health, right? Using a healthy mind, body, spirit curriculum, meditation, yoga, mindfulness, somatic healing, paying attention to the body, paying attention to how we feel physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Length of stay in wilderness therapy increases while length of stay in residential treatment centers decreased. Early on, they were all set length of stay wilderness programs Seven weeks. Seven, actually, it was seven weeks or three weeks. There were two choices. And residential treatment centers were commonly two and a half years. But what we've seen change is wilderness therapy, length of stay has increased. Residential treatment has decreased somewhere on the average of about a year, less than what it was in those days. And then they get combined with step-down transitional programming, sober living. 
you know, transitional program. Back into the community, experimenting with change, experimenting with growth, temptation, choices, more family contact, less supervision, but still some kind of safety net there, some kind of therapeutic support. So the take home, it's been an evolution uh, of theory. Um, in, in early stages, like I said, of theories, the proponents and creators take on a zealous position. But later on, people open themselves up and, and draw and, and take pieces from this or from that, similar to parenting. I think a lot of us when we were young, when I was young and had young children, I had a much more narrow perspective. And I think what our children do for us at Evoke, the children that end up here, is they broaden us, right? They stretch us. We pride ourselves on what we don't know. To understand our strengths and weaknesses, notice what you look for in treatment for your child. Right? Ask yourself questions. Do I want them, do I need them to be happy and in the short term? Am I looking for something behavioral that's going to extinguish? What sells to me? And what does that tell me about my context? The idea is to adjust to the client, adjust to the child, to their diagnosis, their stage of development, their, their, the stage of treatment that they're in. Salvador Mnuchin, one of the fathers, one of the founders of family therapy, said that health in the family can't be measured statically, that it gets measured over time, in part in a family's ability to adjust to each child and to every child's development as they grow up. Every child is different. Every child has different needs, different strengths, weaknesses, and the very same child will change over time. You know, learning to value the process and, and also recognize that we live in a world of outcomes too. Not to get married to that, not to hold on tightly to that, to the exclusion of the process, but learning to value at times the, the outcome. It's okay to say to a child, we want you to reach this level. We want you to reach this objective before you move on to the next stage, before there's the reward or there's the broadening of choices and freedoms. That's okay. Of course, separating out the groups and adolescents, we separate out the groups. I, I listed here on the war story because it's a perfect example of this process. The war story is an assignment we ask our clients and students to write about a negative behavior. It can be drugs. It can be something other than drugs and alcohol and why it was so fun, what, what, what drew you to it. And, and celebrate it, if you will, in this assignment so that we can see what needs that it was meeting. That's one of the hardest letters for parents to get, especially if we don't explain it on the front end. And I've always said this over the years. It is, and I don't think it's a coincidence, it is the one assignment that clients and students forget, I put that in quotes, air quotes, forget to send home with a therapist because they don't want to show you that side of themselves right they know how to check off the boxes they know the right answers they know to say my promiscuity my drugs my defiance was wrong and appropriate i've got to get rid of that but what if they wrote a war story talking about why defiance felt so good right why being why why why, why what, what was the, the payoff for their depression? What was the draw for marijuana? You know, when I have a, a child who's smoking marijuana often and says to me in week one, I didn't really like it, my response is, that doesn't make any sense. I'm sure there's a part of you you could identify with that you may be willing to let it go and see the harmful consequences, but that's not the part that got you here. Let's talk about what drew you to it, because if we remove in your case, marijuana, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to feed that part of you that was getting fed by it, how to deal with it. Um, the, the assignments that, that we pay attention to at a vote versus the assessing discussions, you know, I would say to the clients all the time, if you have a good week, it, it works for me. If you have a bad week, it works for me. Either way, I, I'm learning something. Either way, I have something to pay attention to. Either way, I have something to, to, to teach your parents about. And so, yes, there are assignments. Yes, there are markers for, for varying stages of, of, of treatment, progress, and growth that we look at 
indicators that we pay attention to. And if you struggle or stagnate, that can tell us something just as valuable. The staff relationships are phenomenally parallel to, to home relationships, whether it be parents or teachers or peers, right? Because they're living with them eight days in a row every other week for eight days. They're living with them. And so when we walk into a group during the therapist days, we're really walking into a, a family therapy session where the staff are standing proxy for you in relationship to your child. You know, the difference between early and late in the program matters too. We, we will treat them differently in the, in the early stages of the program versus the late stages of the program, right? We adjust to them. Early on, there's some basic competencies, right? The I feel statement, practicing some of the basic expectations. Later on, we, we back that off. The later stages have less directive curriculum. We become less directive. We give fewer answers, ask more questions, open the box up a, a little bit more. You know, what other programs tell us is that um, it's a hard adjustment for families because the work here is dynamic. It is a relatively small box. And that parents and children, for that matter, I met with this alumni, like I said, uh, of 13 years this afternoon. And, and they had been at, at other programs also. And now we're a professional in the field doing great work for families, young people. And, and what they said to me was, wilderness changed my life. And, and what they said was remarkable. What they said was, the first morning I woke up in wilderness changed my life. It's an amazing invention. In many ways, the safest, we try to make it the safest emotional space that they'll ever be in. Um, I, I always say to, to, to our clients, um, when they're trying to convince us, you know, that, that you guys, you parents are idiots, and they use a lot of words, some more colorful than that. My response is, okay, your parents are an idiot, and I'm an idiot, and you're an idiot, and your teachers, your professors, your bosses, Right? They're all going to be idiots. So how are you going to deal with those idiots after Evoke? And learning to, to work through the relationships here is the best pattern, the best preparation that we know for the next step, for the next stages of your life. All right. Questions and comments. Uh, the first question, some of these concepts seem to need the ability to introspect. Our son being an athlete doesn't seem to have that ability. He has no sense of self, doesn't recognize his own impact. My fear is that some of these wonderful concepts can't be absorbed. You're absolutely right. Thank you for saying that. That's a great qualification. You know, for, for, for them, it's social scripts. It's, it's behavioral theory, right? Um, they're learning uh, about things on a, on a much more behavioral, practical level. And those groups specifically are designed and the the staff and the therapists in those groups are trained to deal with autism spectrum disorder individuals. So you're absolutely right. And again, to make this point, younger children share that trait in common with Asperger's, with, with people that, that are on the spectrum. And that's why 13-year-olds, for example, in that program often have a more behavioral, it's more of a mentoring approach, really. Modeling, mentoring, behavioral than a 17 or 25-year-old. So you're absolutely right. Thank you for mentioning that. And we absolutely adjust to, to that, that presentation, that diagnosis, for sure. Next question. Um, this is good. good question to ask myself as well. Absolutely. You know, a little bit of this as I was doing this, and I realized a lot of it is about what we do in our approach. But I, but I agree, there's a lot to, to extrapolate from here. I think a lot of my early broadcasts 10 years ago were a lot about theory and diagnoses and, and kind of sharing with you what I knew through my education so that you could take the principles, the skills, the tools, the insights from that, draw upon that for your own work. Now I spend most of my broadcasts 
talking directly to parents about their approach. So this is a little bit of a blast from the past, like I said. No other questions. Okay. There's a comment there. Can I read that comment, Andrea? You post it. A parent says, I like this topic so far. Love hearing the history. This has already given me some security I needed from how the approaches from how he approaches things and how he sees things. I like his ability oh I like his ability to see how far they actually are and see how things how things can always be improved with these good examples. So I guess that was talking about me. And a new question popped up. What new or recent changes have you made in the process out there in the woods? Are there any now being experimented? Um, th there's some new theories that, that a lot of people are grabbing, gravitating to. The ACT, uh, Action and Commitment Therapy, is, is something that a lot of the new therapists, um, a lot of mindfulness stuff has come to us in the past uh, few years, right? Mindfulness, meditation, loving kindness meditation, yoga, um, things like that has been something that we're doing. We introduced a, an oasis for the young adults, so they go to a to a permanent structure out there, a semi-permanent structure, midway through the program. Our autism spectrum disorder focus group does some adventure activities, so that's something we've expanded upon. We still remain committed to the to the model of primitive living nomadic in general, and more and more and more family work. More, I, I think really what I've seen us do is, is really just dive deeper and deeper into the sophistication of compassionate family approach. You know, like I've said, and I say this a lot, I've been doing this for 22 years. And a lot of the programs that, that, are, are, that I work with, that we, that we make referrals to, or, or that, that, that children go to after us, you know, the owners and the, and the people that created the program, they've been in this for decades. And there's a difference between a 50-year-old like I am now and a 28-year-old like I was when I started. I was passionate and enthusiastic. I, I was bright back then. I cared about kids and families. I wanted to make a change. I wanted to make a difference. And, and that was wonderful. And 22 years is something. It really is something. It makes a difference. So sometimes when I look back at the early broadcasts that I, that I broadcast like 10 years ago, the reason I don't do them is because it's too simple. It's too paint by the numbers. It was okay for back then, but we have really evolved and, and flourished in our work. And then the research has continued. Uh, we want all parents to go to six 12-step support groups, some combination of Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous. You can Google those and find meetings in your area. You can also go to NAMI.org. And if you go to NAMI.org, N-A-M-I.org, you can find affordable or free classes and resources in your area with your local chapter. Please follow us or subscribe to us on social media. Share our podcast. The podcasts are, are free for the public. Right? They're, they're, they're recorded the day after. Please, um, please share those with anybody um, to, to expand the reach and the word. On your iOS or iPhone device, search Evoke Therapy Programs. Subscribe to us there. You can listen and download those on the train when you don't have when you don't have Wi-Fi or cell connectivity. If you download them on Android, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find us at Evoke Therapy. On Facebook, you search Evoke Therapy Programs. The Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook is is an organization that's set up to help families that can't afford treatment. Um, and then, of course, if you look at our blog, you can find we, we produce a couple of articles each week for families, sometimes written by alumni, sometimes by staff, some by, some by therapists, by myself. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available and on Amazon. Uh, we have a pretty good crowd tonight, so if you've read it, I'm, I'm open to your feedback. Happy to hear an, an Amazon uh, on Amazon for you to, to rate it and, and, and give feedback. You can also get an audio purchase of it. Through Amazon. The next parent workshop that we would like all parents to go through, if possible, is January 20th and 21st. 
That's in our Oregon program. You can combine that if you're making a trip with a visit to your child. If your therapist thinks it's good timing, either at Cascades in Oregon or at Entrada, contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more information. Uh, the Finding You starts this week. There actually there was somebody who dropped out, so if there's a last minute spot if, if anybody wants it, starting this Thursday, um, January 11th through 14th. Um, if you want to do deeper work, family of origin, mindfulness, compassionate, emotional work, the Finding You is for six or seven individuals, and um, it's it's really an expanded version of all the work that we teach here. It's a, it's the real healing. Private family intensives are also available. You can go to our website or contact admissions or email intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information or for questions. I will be in Palo Alto this Wednesday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. speaking at the Palo Alto Preparatory School, talking about boundaries, what they are and what gets in the way. Uh, and New York City, so that's, a, that's for anybody to attend. And then I'll be in New York City uh, on Monday. Monday, January 22nd from 7 to 9 at the City University of New York in Midtown. Parent support group. Uh, anybody's invited. Uh, parent sharing, parent stories, some teaching that I'll be doing. Email andrea at evoketherapy.com for more questions, if you have any questions, or to RSVP. Our pursuits program are available for adventure trips for families or young adults. Think therapy light. Think um, fun with them, some therapeutic support, maybe reconnection to some of the work that's been done. Any last questions? I've heard as I've heard that sending it out to a wellness program at the age of 13 won't meet with much success and may end up having to go back again at a later age. Can you please comment on that? That that can happen, but it can happen at 17 also. My son came to the program at 13, turned 14 when he's when he was in the wilderness a few months later. Um, and he still draws upon it to this day. So I, I don't necessarily think that that's true. Some of the therapy that I went to at 13 and younger are some of the things that I still draw upon. So it is true that the, the, the older the brain, the more that they can um, cognitively retain, make sense out of uh, uh, things in the moment. But, but my child, my son, who's now 25, still draws upon remembers vividly, I still remember vividly some of the lessons that we shared together while in the wilderness. So, yes, it, you know, <clears throat> it'd be nice if everybody came to a crisis around the age of 17 or 18 so we could treat them as they, they're transitioning into adulthood, but sometimes 13-year-olds and younger need it. So there's some disadvantages for sure, and there's also some advantages because changing the course or trajectory can be important. I've always said this. <clears throat> think in your mind about an intervention that is too late and what are the consequences. And when you think of an intervention that's too late, you can think of some pretty horrific consequences, right? Some pretty horrific downsides of an intervention that comes too late. Think of, of an intervention that comes too early, and that's what you're talking about, perhaps. The downside isn't as severe. The downside is maybe they don't get it as much. When my son left wilderness, he didn't have the kind of insight that I think some of the 17, 18, 22 year olds have for sure. But we had a different trajectory. We had the building blocks. We had the bridge built between us. We had the experience together that, that later on blossomed when he was 15, 16, and 17. And we drew upon that experience. So, yes, there's pros and cons, but that's kind of my thought about it. All right, the next topic will be Monday, January 15th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. I uh, haven't decided on a topic yet. If you have any requests for books or topics, I'm happy to take those. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope this is a helpful touch point for you. I hope it's a helpful point of contact. I appreciate it. on behalf of your children, thank you for the investment of attending these. Have a great evening. Take care, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.